we work in an amazing industry. Scheduled commercial aviation began with a 23-minute journey across Tampa Bay, Florida on the 1st of January 1914. And since then, it has changed our world immeasurably for the better. And as we celebrate our industry's first 100 years, we can be proud of our achievements. Flying is a team effort that started with the partnership of four visionaries. Percival Fansler, an entrepreneur who saw commercial opportunity in the technology of flight. Thomas Benoit, who built the aircraft. Tony Janus, who safely piloted the plane to its destination. And Abram File, the hero of the day, who purchased the first ticket. And the airline industry quickly grew from a single aircraft, one route, and a lone passenger. And this year, we will connect 3.3 billion passengers and 52 million tons of cargo, over 50,000 routes, and 100,000 flights a day. Today, aviation is the lifeblood of the, of the global economy. The industry supports over 58 million jobs and $2.4 trillion in annual economic activity. It creates jobs for Kenyan farmers who sell fresh flowers in world markets. It facilitates global supply chains so that workers in many nations can collaborate to build computers, cars, and even aeroplanes. And aviation delivers many of the real-world goods that are traded in the virtual shops of internet commerce. And as a catalyst for economic and social development, aviation and the businesses that we support have spread prosperity and lifted countless people from poverty. The intangibles create even greater value. Flying brings people together, families, friends, business colleagues. It helps minds to meet and exchange ideas. It gives people the freedom to be almost anywhere in just 24 hours. And it's turned our wonderfully big planet into a wonderfully small world of enormous and wonderful opportunities. And as we stand at the dawn of commercial aviation's second century, what will define our future success? We can take some inspiration from the Chicago Convention, which is marking its 70th anniversary this year. It set the framework for post-war aviation. And in it, governments declared that the future development of international civil aviation can greatly help to create and preserve friendship and understanding among the nations and peoples of the world. Well, we are achieving the vision of the Chicago Convention on an enormous scale. Now, airlines fly more people in a day than in the entire year that the Convention was signed. And even with the enormous growth over the last 100 years, there is plenty of potential still to be achieved. And the key to unlocking that potential is a global mindset. We are the industry that connects people and business to make global possible. And securing our future potential with a global mindset, mindset begins with our immediate challenges. To be profitable, safe, and secure businesses, to provide efficient, customer-focused services, and to be sustainable in all that we do. Now, on the first of these challenges, our financial performance, there is much to be done. As a global industry, our financial performance doesn't yet match the value that we deliver. This year, we expect airlines to achieve a collective global profit of $18 billion. That sounds impressive, but the brutal economic reality is that on revenues of $746 billion, we will earn an average net margin of just 2.4%, and that's less than $6 a passenger. Now, some airlines will do better. But even if you're smart or lucky enough to be one of those, every day is still a struggle to keep revenue ahead of costs. The good news is that airline profits are improving. The average return on invested capital today is 5.4%, up from 1.4% in 2008. But we're still far from earning the 7 to 8% cost of capital that investors would expect. 
Airlines are, however, working towards solutions that deliver value to both customers and investors. Our customers expect efficient global connectivity. But the regulatory structure prevents the global consolidation that has happened in other industries. By creatively working together through alliances, joint ventures, franchising and domestic consolidation, we are seeing some significant results. Consumers have more choice. The number of city pairs has doubled since 1994. Flying is an even greater bargain. You can circle the world for about the cost of four iPads. And passengers are enjoying better products. US Airlines, for example, are investing almost a billion dollars a month in product upgrades this year. And shortly, we should begin to see the impact of the work that we're doing to modernize how airline products are distributed. Late last month, the US Department of Transportation gave tentative approval to Resolution 787, the foundation document for our new distribution capability, which our last AGM supported so strongly. The DOT clearly understands the potential for NDC. And they stated in their tentative approval that the use of common technical standards could facilitate the marketplace development of distribution practices and channels. This would make it easier for consumers to compare competing carriers' fares and ancillary products across multiple distribution channels. And this would make purchasing more convenient, allow carriers to customize service and amenity offers, and increase transparency, efficiency, and competition. NDC is clearly recognized as a winning development for consumers, and that's good for the industry too. Alongside achieving stronger financial performance, we face the constant challenge of safety. And that's been our top priority right from the beginning. And I'm told that the, the aircraft that carried that first paying passenger 100 years ago was even nicknamed Safety First. Flying is incredibly safe. In 2013, there were 29 million flights with Western-built jet aircraft and only 12 hull losses. And we're determined to improve on this performance. IOSA is an example. Our AGM host, Qatar Airways, was the first carrier to meet its global standards and join the IOSA registry. Today, 393 airlines are on the registry. And as a group, their safety performance is significantly better than the average for airlines that have not completed IOSA. We're making IOSA an even more effective standard. Enhanced IOSA will change the audit from a snapshot of an airline safety management into a system for constant monitoring. And this will be a requirement for all IOTA airlines from 2015. The loss of MH370 points us to an immediate need. A large commercial airliner going missing without a trace for so long is unprecedented in modern aviation. And it must not happen again. IATA, ICAO, and experts from around the world are working together to agree on the best options to improve global tracking capabilities. In September, a draft of recommendations will be given to ICAO, and data will guide this and other safety improvements. We're moving forward with a global aviation data management project known as GADM, and this will create the world's largest resource of operational information. Fueled by data collected from partners including ICAO, the FAA, and EASA, it's perfectly consistent with the global mindset needed for aviation's second century. And looking further ahead, our ultimate goal is to predict the potential for accidents and so ensure that they don't happen. And this isn't science fiction. The growing data in GADM is one of the building blocks. Each new data contribution and every improvement in our analytical capabilities moves this closer to reality. The second century global mindset extends to the complex challenge of security. Commercial aviation is an instrument of peace, but sadly, it has also been a target for terrorism, and its security must be protected. Now, airlines help fund global aviation security with taxes and fees, 
costing $8.55 billion a year. And not all of this is even spent on aviation security. And passengers still say that security remains their biggest travel hassle. Inconsistencies across jurisdictions defy understanding. And the focus on prohibited objects sees law-abiding passengers treated with criminal suspicion. There's waste and inefficiency, and we must do a better job. IATA is partnering with the airport's Council International and others to change this. And the goal of our smart security program is to improve effectiveness, efficiency, and the passenger experience. Now, governments have the ultimate responsibility for security, and some are embracing the risk-based approach of smart security with known traveler programs. But with a few exceptions, these and eGate border programs are not linked. We must use the global resources available, and that's not happening now. It was a shock that two passengers cleared checkpoints and boarded MH370 with stolen passports. And then Interpol announced that only a handful of governments use its stolen passport database. Now, airlines go to great trouble and expense to meet government requirements for advanced passenger information. And we expect it to be used effectively to improve security and the passenger experience. Passenger security isn't the only issue that must be addressed. Cargo shipments must be made much more secure through global standards and cooperation with governments and across the supply chain. And that's the framework for the IATA Secure Freight Programme, which is now live in eight countries. A similar approach is needed to guard airline and aircraft IT systems against the risk of cyber attack. And sharing information across the industry and with governments is critical to defending them against this global and dynamic threat. There's plenty of opportunity for the second century mindset of global collaboration, both among governments and with industry, to make a positive contribution to keeping flying secure. And the presence of the US Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, at this AGM signals that international engagement continues to be a priority for his government. And that's good news for us all. There's similar opportunity for the global second century mindset to guide our thinking on infrastructure issues. Airlines need cost-efficient airports and air traffic management services. And these must keep, keep pace with consumer demand. The challenges differ by region. In Europe, there is still paralysis on the single European sky. The European Commission is pushing it, but the member states seem more interested in protecting revenue streams and government jobs. So passengers, the environment, and the European economy all suffer. The expected shortfall in European airport capacity is so serious that by 2035, we could see a 12% gap between demand and infrastructure capacity. And the airport charges directive needs to be much more robust if it's to drive cost efficiencies and encourage effective investment. The Gulf governments have understood and acted upon the industry's need for airport infrastructure. Airports here rank among the most impressive in the world. But air traffic delays result because the region's governments aren't managing finite airspace as a common resource. In Asia and Latin America, governments are aggressively pursuing public-private partnerships for airport development. And we've seen enough failures of poorly structured initiatives to be deeply concerned about the consequences. And in the United States, despite some important progress, Further next-gen investments that are badly needed are just not a high enough priority. The solutions to these challenges all have a political dimension and need government action. And that action must be taken with the understanding that these are critical building blocks for efficient global operations. ICAO's principles on charging provide the global standards which should be followed. And first among equals of these principles is consultation. And through consultation, infrastructure can be developed based on what airlines need and can afford. And that is a guaranteed win-win scenario. And I must emphasize that the light-handed approach has been a dismal failure 
when applied to the economic regulation of infrastructure. The market power that most airports have needs a counterbalance with effective independent regulators applying well-established international norms. And that will bring about fair charging regimes which facilitate the enhanced co connectivity that communities everywhere are seeking. As we look ahead to the second century, the immediate priorities for airspace management are the single European sky and next gen in the USA. But even as we struggle to deliver these, we should think bigger and question whether airspace for global connectivity really needs to be managed based on political borders. Long before we mark our 200th anniversary, I hope that we're thinking of airspace in terms of an efficiently managed global resource. Efficient infrastructure will also do much to improve the customer experience. And so can technology, from shopping, through the journey, and back home again. And the basic vision is the same for both shippers and passengers. A hassle-free journey with empowerment to customize and control their experience. Technology is changing our processes. For example, by the year end, over a quarter of travelers will have access to the full suite of IATA fast travel self-service options. And our customers now take this for granted. In fact, they want more. Today's travelers expect to be constantly connected with Wi-Fi everywhere. And they also want all the touch points along their journey to be connected and focused on giving them a door-to-door -door seamless experience. Now, it's going to take significant collaboration with a global mindset among all the industry players, airlines, airports, hotels, hire cars, and so on, to satisfy this need. The expectation of shippers who are paying a premium for speed are similar. E-freight will help us to link the process together. And the Cargo 2000 Master Operating Plan continues to define industry quality standards. But even after six years of work on E-Freight, it will still be a struggle to reach our target of 22% e-airway bill penetration by the year end. A partnership approach is accelerating progress, and it will be critical to the next goal, which is to reduce the average shipping time by 48 hours before 2020. And all of this points us to a big picture view of the world in which there's value to be unlocked by working more with our industry partners to meet customer demands. And of course, global standards will be needed to manage the interaction efficiently with our partners as well as our customers. Partnerships also need to extend to governments. They decide how we're taxed and regulated. Unfortunately, there are many examples of governments getting it wrong. The economic damage of the UK air passenger duty has been acknowledged, but instead of eliminating it, the government is tinkering with the details. In the US, safety regulators may allow the use of cell phones on aircraft. If they do, another group of US regulators may disallow it in the interest of consumer protection. But if safety isn't the issue, then the market should decide, not regulators. In Canada, the Ontario government's budget proposal allocates billions to bringing in new businesses but also more than doubles the tax on jet fuel. And that can only make it more expensive to do business there. An increase in protectionist measures worldwide panders to local interests at the expense of long-term job creation, economic growth, and inward investment. And the Venezuelan government takes the top prize for willful irresponsibility. It is wrongly withholding some $4 billion of airline funds and putting the country's connectivity at risk. Now, on top of direct lobbying, we've told the world through the media that Venezuela is not playing by the rules. It's not surprising that some airlines have stopped flying there. Airlines cannot provide a service if they don't get paid. And the government has responded with more promises than action. And in the meantime, the country's connectivity declines and the economy suffers. And I again urge the Venezuelan government to resolve this quickly and fairly. Now, we'll continue to fight each ill-conceived action by governments. But it would, be, it would be much easier if we found a way to persuade governments of the value of taking a long-term view, abiding by global standards, and using aviation as an economic catalyst. Our partnership with ICAO <clears throat> is an effective vehicle 
to incubate change with a global second century mindset. At its assembly last year, governments agreed to address the unmanageable confusion of some 60 passenger rights regimes by developing harmonized guidance. And just last week, an ICAO panel proposed a set of principles that found their first expression in a resolution of our last AGM. And in response to another industry priority, last year's assembly also called for a tightening up of the legal framework on unruly passengers. And ICAO promptly convened a diplomatic conference at which the Tokyo Convention was amended for that purpose. Experience teaches that we achieve the best results when governments use regulation to solve real, not imagined, problems and take full advantage of expert advice and consultation. And they also need to calibrate regulation and taxation appropriately to facilitate global connectivity and ensure that the costs imposed by regulation don't exceed its benefits. And finally, they must also respect global standards wherever they exist. And if we can establish this global mindset approach with all our government partners, we'll be well on our way to establishing a solid footing for aviation's second century. Encouragingly, that is the way that our approach to sustainability is developing. Sustainability is our license to grow. And last year saw landmark progress. When we last met, we asked governments for a global market-based measure to manage our carbon footprint. And this is essential if we're to meet our commitment to carbon neutral growth from 2020. At the ICAO Assembly, governments agreed to develop a proposal for such a measure by 2016. And turning the Assembly's laudable intention into a more specific agreement on an actual mechanism will be a challenge. But we need to support that effort. It will be as difficult for airlines, who will foot the bill, as it will be for governments. A global mandatory carbon offset scheme is just one transitional element of our strategy. Our ultimate goal is to achieve sustainability by reducing carbon emissions through improvements in technology, operations and infrastructure. Continued industry unity is needed for success. Airlines, airports, air navigation service providers and manufacturers are united by a global strategy and targets. And this puts the entire industry at the forefront of the debate on sustainability. And it's the perfect example of the second century global mindset. Now we must stay the course. As we embark on commercial aviation's second century, we carry an important responsibility. Aviation is critically important to humanity. And we must continue to make, it, make flying safer, more secure, increasingly efficient and sustainable. And there are some preconditions for that. The first is that we need to be profitable businesses. The second is that we join with our industry and government partners in a global effort to resolve today's issues in preparation for tomorrow's successes. Aviation faces many challenges, but we should never lose sight of the fact that we're privileged to be leaders of a truly great industry. Among those who witnessed the Benoit airboat carry a single passenger across Tampa Bay in 1914, who could have imagined what aviation would look like today? Well, at least one person could see that something incredible would evolve. What was impossible yesterday is an accomplishment today, while tomorrow heralds the unbelievable. Prophetic words from Percival Fansler, the visionary entrepreneur who launched our industry. A century later, aviation is powering economies and lifting the human spirit. We've broken the bounds of speed and distance with ubiquitous global mobility. And this very day, 100,000 flights will take 9 million people where they want to go to do something they want to do. And aviation's greatest contribution is the freedom it gives people to follow their dreams and change their lives. In 100 years, we've turned our enormous planet into a small world. And in doing so, we have created a very big future for us all. Thank you very much.